wonderful. <laughs> so, well, good afternoon. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Carol Backhouse, the director of the Center for the Study of Religion. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker. Uh, Nader Saidi received uh, an MS in economics from Pahlavi University in Iran and a PhD in sociology from the University of Wisconsin Madison. He taught sociology at UCLA, Vanderbilt, University of Virginia, and Carleton College. Four years ago, he joined UCLA Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures to teach on Baha'i history and religion in Iran. Um, he's an adjunct professor and the inaugural holder of the Taslimi lectureship in Baha'i history and religion in Iran. His areas of interest include Iranian studies, Baha'i studies, social theory, and peace studies. Be more interested in war studies, but <laughs> discuss that some other time. His books include The Birth of Social Theory, Logos and Civilization, and Gate of the Heart. Uh, without uh, uh, further ado, I present Professor Saeed. Stand here, right? For the yeah. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and I would like to thank uh, Center for the Study of Religion, uh, Carol in particular, and uh, uh, Sunny as well for uh, making the arrangements for this particular talk. Also, I thank all of you for uh, showing up uh, in the middle of the day. Uh, the, topic, the topic of my uh, talk is uh, writings of uh, Baha'u'llah uh, in, uh, in the light of the two concepts of arc of ascent and arc of descent. In other words, I want to introduce the writings of Baha'u'llah and the worldview, but I, I would do that uh, through these two categories, uh, arc of ascent and arc of descent. So what I'm planning to do first is to briefly uh, uh, define and discuss what is arc of ascent and arc of descent. And uh, then I would give a very brief uh, example of approach to arc of ascent and arc of descent uh, in uh, Persian uh, mystical traditions, uh, but in particular in the writings of one particular writer who was living at the same time that Baha'u'llah was writing, uh, the leader of the Sheikhi sect of Shia Islam. Uh, his name is uh, Karim Khan Kirmani. Uh, and then I would uh, discuss the writings of Baha'u'llah and how he would understand the Ark of Ascent and Ark of Descent. A concept of uh, uh, spiritual journey uh, is uh, more or less a universal uh, uh, concern and principle in variety of cultures, spiritual and religious traditions. And uh, part of these uh, traditions uh, usually uh, is uh, discussed in terms of these categories of arc of descent and arc of ascent. So it has a long history in the writings of uh, spiritual traditions, but in Islamic Sufism in particular, it has uh, a, a very uh, determined and, and focused uh, uh, emphasis. But what these words mean, arc of ascent and arc of descent, um, it varies uh, in different contexts. So for example, uh, usually both arc of descent and arc of ascent are perceived as different stages of the act of creation. So from God, the world is going to descend, to be created. And in the 
typical understandings of that, which is based upon the science, uh, particularly astronomy of the time, the idea is that a number of intellects would be created, for example, together with that, um, and out of these intellects, uh, different souls would be created, different heavenly bodies would be created, and this process continues, this descent from God, until we come to the planet Earth. And this is the end of this arc of descent. And so creation of the four elements becomes the final point of this arc of descent. From here, we have the beginning of arc of ascent. Namely, vegetables come, vegetable kingdom, out of the mineral kingdom, then we have animals. Finally, we have the emergence of human being, which would have a history, and this is defined in terms of varieties of prophets, spiritual traditions, and so this becomes Ark of Ascent. But as you see here, both Ark of Ascent and Descent are different moments within the act of creation. But most of the times, the, the concept of the Ark of Ascent and Ark of Descent is defined in a different way. In the sense that Ark of Descent is the process of creation. So from God, the world is going to be created, and this ends up in human being. Now this human being, at the end of this arc of ascent, arc of descent, in the second sense of that, of course feels the separation and alienation from its origin, from its truth, which is God. And therefore there is this yearning for return and discovery uh, of, the, of the real home, of, the, of, of one's own truth. And this becomes the occasion for the beginning of Ark of Ascent. So Ark of Ascent here becomes a spiritual journey uh, through which one goes beyond the phenomenal world, goes beyond the pluralities and the apparent conflict of these pluralities, and discovers beyond this appearance there is one unity, the only thing which is real, which is, which is God. And the whole reality is understood as expressions, as reflection of that one truth. So emergence of this consciousness of unity as the supreme principle of reality, this becomes the ultimate moment or reflection of this arc of ascent. Normally in varieties of traditions, this arc of ascent and realization of this spiritual insight is understood to be the highest moment, the climax, the end point, really, of this uh, spiritual uh, advancement and development. But in the writings of the Persian prophet Baha'u'llah, <coughs> and he wrote many, many works, uh, about 100 books, uh, beginning uh, 1852, when his uh, uh, um, uh, uh, ministry begins uh, till uh, 1892 when he passes away. Through his writings, uh, the concept of mysticism and a spiritual journey is uh, extremely important, yet for Baha'u'llah, he adds a new concept, a new arc of descent. And that means that for Baha'u'llah, the arc of descent, as it has been understood so far, namely consciousness of the unity of all beings as the supreme reality, this is actually a, a supreme achievement, an extremely important one, but it is not the end point. It is actually the beginning of another very important stage of a spiritual journey, which for Baha'u'llah, this is the new arc of descent. In other words, if the first arc of descent was coming from God to the human being, that we would be created, and if the arc of ascent is this human being goes towards God and understands the reality of everything as, as God, for Baha'u'llah, now mysticism and spiritual journey is just in its beginning stages. What we need is a new arc of descent, namely, with maintaining that consciousness of the unity of all reality, we have to now descend to the world. And in our descent to the world, the way we look at ourselves, at other human beings, at nature, at cultures, at religions, and so on, should be based upon this new insight 
which was produced out of Ark of Ascent. In other words, for Baha'u'llah, the Ark of Ascent, uh, it is uh, uh, realized in its complete form when we, uh, we are transformed. Uh, not only the abstract consciousness that everything is one, but also our whole reality is transformed. And for that reason, with this consciousness, when we come to the world, we relate to human beings and the like. Our feelings, our understanding, and our behavior in the world corresponds to and becomes a reflection of that consciousness of unity. That means, for example, that you cannot claim at this stage in the writings of Baha'u'llah that you have a complete spiritual journey and yet you believe in a slavery. You cannot claim that you have a complete spiritual journey and yet you believe in patriarchy or various forms of violence or, uh, or uh, varieties of forms of uh, discriminations against different people and so on, whether it is uh, justified in terms of religion or other things. So, um, in order to discuss the writings of Baha'u'llah in terms of this new concept of Ark of Ascent to be, to be completed with the Ark of Descent, uh, I give you first a very brief uh, example of two traditions uh, which uh, have Ark of Ascent, but they, they don't have the Ark of Descent. Ark of Descent is not emphasized. And then I'll uh, focus on the writings of Baha'u'llah. The first one, uh, which uh, I will be very brief on it, because hours and hours and days and weeks and so on is needed to adequately address it, is the Persian mystical traditions, Persian mystical poetry, which is one of the greatest achievements of Persian culture and one of the greatest contributions of Persian culture to the world. And the uh, when you look at the Persian mystical tradition, whether it is Rumi, whether it is Sanai, whether it is Attar or others, what you see is a magnificent, beautiful expression of the Ark of Ascent. Ark of Ascent in the most beautiful expressions of that, the most complicated, uh, uh, wonderful expressions of that you can find in these authors. However, because of the time that they were living, it was impossible for these people to be able to translate this arc of ascent, this insight of unity, into this arc of descent. And therefore, when they are talking in their poetries about concrete human beings, uh, none of them are questioning the slavery, rather perceive the slavery as something completely natural. Almost all of them have really hostilities towards women and different expressions uh, of, of their poetry and so on, consistently uh, talks in that way. Uh, in terms of members of other religious groups, uh, extremely intolerant, many times violent expressions, you would find it in all of them. Uh, even, for example, Rumi and Attar, two of the greatest, perhaps two greatest, uh, mystics of Iranian culture, not only consistently write insulting things against Jews, against Christians, against Zoroastrians, but both of them write against Zoroaster, Prophet Zoroaster. And the Zoroaster, which, which now for Iranians is perceived as a sacred being for all Iranians, including almost all Muslim Iranians. Uh, in their writings, that was not the way they directly address mentions of us and define him as, as an evil imposter. Uh, but this uh, doesn't mean that the art of ascent that they have created should not, should not be celebrated. Uh, it, it is a great achievement, but because of their time, it was impossible that this could be translated uh, into uh, particular expressions uh, of that. So it remains abstract, really, this uh, insight. The other example that I want to give is the example, actually, of a, of a person that he claims to have Ark of Ascent, but really he doesn't have even Ark of Ascent. Um, 
I would be very, I try to be very brief about uh, him. His name is Haj Muhammad Karim Khan Kermani. Uh, is one of the most prolific authors of his time. He is the leader of a particular sect in Shia Islam called Sheikhi sect. The Sheikhi sect was a really uh, pioneering and intellectual type uh, with, uh, with great mystical orientations. Uh, it was created, founded by Sheikh Ahmad Ahsai. What happened was that when the uh, the other prophet of the Baha'i faith, namely the, the Bab, uh, made his claim in Iran, and this is the year 1844. Majority of the Shaykhis accepted the Bab, accepted the claim of the Bab, and became followers of the Bab. A minority of the Shaykhis did not accept the claim of the Bab. The leader of this minority Shaykhis was this person, Haj Karim Khan Kermani. And for that reason, he was very envious and very hostile to the Bab and later to Baha'u'llah because the potential people that could be his followers, uh, he had lost them to the Babi religion. And for that reason, he is the first person, the first cleric uh, who wrote a book of refutation against the Bab. This is 1845. And after 1845, each year he wrote at least one another new book of refutation against the Bab. The book that I want to refer to that very briefly is called Irshad al Avam, namely Instructing the Ignorant. He writes, he wrote this in Persian. Most of his works are in, in English, <laughs> sorry, in Arabic, uh, but uh, and for him, uh, writing in, in Persian was, uh, was something uh, which was opposed to his dignity. So he's compromising himself in writing Persian. He says these things. And he says primarily that I wrote this for women, because they can't understand. They don't know anything. And of course, they, don't, they can't understand Arabic. And so I'm, I'm writing it so that they would know. Um, Yet, these four volumes a book, Irshad al Avam, is the most important work of Ashkan Khan Kermani. And so it's really an encyclopedia of, of, of his ideas. So I'll be very brief about his approach to these things. On the one hand, he talks in a way that he is very much um, focused on this spiritual journey. For example, he takes literally Quranic statements which says that all beings, all the atoms of existence, they are engaged in the praise and glorification of God. He takes it literally. And so for him, all beings are uh, intoxicated with God and are expressing their love for God and praise for God. So the world as he claims to see is a very mystical world. He's, he's constantly in, in this spiritual journey. Also, he considers himself as the expert of the concept of Me'raj. Me'raj is the idea that Prophet Muhammad had an ascent to heaven, which is a very important concept in Islamic discourse. It has a basis in the Quran as well. And uh, to be honest with you, it's the supreme expression of the concept of a spiritual journey within Islamic discourse. Um, but this idea has been understood in varieties of uh, literal forms. And uh, Haj Karim, uh, this person, uh, he considers himself as the, the expert on this issue, and he writes on, on that uh, uh, extensively. So, but what is his actual understanding of the world? What I, called Arc of Descent. Um, I give you uh, three examples. First of all, his philosophy is centered on his conception of the body of Prophet Muhammad. The previous Sheikh leaders made a distinction between two types of bodies, but he collapses them together. And so his emphasis is on material body, body that you have and I have, the body that we can see. 
And his point is that the body of Prophet Muhammad is qualitatively different from other bodies. And so he argues that the first thing that God created was the intellect of Prophet Muhammad, and after that, the body of Prophet Muhammad. Out of the body of the Prophet Muhammad, not out of his intellect, out of the body of Prophet Muhammad, uh, uh, Shia Imams were created. And out of the Shia Imams, out of the race of the Shia Imams, other prophets and messengers of God, like Jesus, Moses, and so on, were, uh, were created. They came into existence. Um, this body is different from normal bodies. And here, things that he says it has a long history and tradition, both in Shia Islam and Sunni Islam. Body of Prophet Muhammad does not have a shadow. Body of Prophet Muhammad has never any waste. Uh, he can see uh, both uh, front and backward, and many other characteristics. The, the Shia texts have extended this concept to There are some chairs here. Also. Uh, this also had a little mic. People, if they need to sit here, they can move maybe this camera. We have plenty of chairs. Yes, you want? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So half of nature is defined as good because they are the ones who accepted God and prophet of God. Half of nature becomes evil because they are infidels. And so for example, all the animals who are wild, he defines them, they are wild because they rejected their prophet, they rejected God, they are uh, infidels, and for that reason, God has made them in form of, and so elimination of this half of nature in any form and so on is the greatest virtue that we can have. So instead of that concept of everything has praise of God, which is a beautiful concept, his approach to nature becomes absolute hatred rather than love, seeing everything as sacred as expressions of God. What about human beings? He ends his, uh, the fourth volume of his book with discussion of what types of human beings you should become friend, what type of human beings you should be communicating with. They are, they are not evil, so that friendship and communication is OK. And here he gives the list of 40 categories of people who are evil, and therefore communication with them, friendship with them, in any form of that is prohibited. Um, and the list, because it is 40, is a very long one. Aside from the fact that if you don't believe in God, then you are evil. If you don't believe in Islam, you are evil. If you are not a Shia Muslim, you are evil. I mean, you can be a Sunni, but you are evil. Uh, um, aside from that, which these are predictable, then there are these whole other categories. Um, for example, all women. Women are defined as people who are uh, uh, incapable of reason and rationality, and morally also uh, they, they are problematic. And so they are infectious, and you should, you should avoid it. He mentions Bedouins. You know, Bedouins in the Quran a, a few times uh, are uh, presented in a negative fashion. And this has to do with the particular time of the Prophet Muhammad. But this person takes that statement of the Quran makes it eternal generalization, and so therefore all Bedouins become evil people. That after 12 centuries, now they, he's defining them as evil. People who are in any form in art, for instance, he says people who play chess, these are evil people, you are people who engage in painting, people who are born out of wedlock, haramzadeh, bastards, because he says that since their body is impure, their souls, God also makes their souls impure. And so they are by nature, it's not that it is the fault of their parents, by their nature themselves are impure, and you should not communicate. And it, and it goes on this list, I won't take your time, we want to discuss Baha'u'llah. But this is an example of a person who claims to be the expert on the spiritual journey of Prophet Muhammad to heavens, which is really ultimate expression of the concept of Ark of Ascent, um, and makes all those pronouncements in his reaction to different religions, in his reaction to nature, in re his reaction to human beings, becomes really embodiment of hate. That's an example that I, I say that this is a claim of, of Ark of Ascent, but there is no trace or reality. Persian classical uh, 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 poetry, it has a serious, beautiful Ark of Ascent. Because of their time limitations, uh, they, they could not have an, a complete Ark of Descent. There are elements, expressions of Ark of Descent in the writings sometimes, but predominantly it couldn't be. But this Karim Khan is different. Everything that he writes is mobilized out of envy and anger and his wishes to be the leader. But he was very intelligent and you read his writing, he's very creative. But the whole context, interpretive, and so on is. Now let's uh, discuss the writings of Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah's writings can be divided into three stages. When I was writing, uh, this is 20 years ago, a book on the writings of Baha'u'llah called Logos and Civilization, 
out of my research, I came to this idea that writings of Baha'u'llah are written in three distinct phases, stages, and each stage is emphasizing one particular principle. Just before the publication of the book, I discovered a statement from Baha'u'llah himself, who said uh, a particular statement, which we don't have time, so I won't discuss that, but it was really the confirmation that he, his writings has been written in three stages. He's, so he says that his pen has been raised addressing first the mystics, then the divines, ulama, clerics, and then rulers and kings of the world. And you'll see that the three stages that I mentioned is really that. So what are these three stages? The first stage is uh, writings of Baha'u'llah during his first eight years of his of staying in Baghdad. Uh, in 1852, Baha'u'llah was imprisoned in in the city of Tehran, in the dungeon in Tehran. And the, at the end of that, he was exiled to Ottoman Empire. And at first, he was in the city of Baghdad. He was in Baghdad for about 11 years. The first eight years, so from 1853 to 1860, uh, these are the first stages of the writings of Baha'u'llah. And this stage of the writings of Baha'u'llah are really the arc of ascent. Namely, the language is language of mysticism. Baha'u'llah uses, and because of the place that he was located, uh, symbolism of Islamic mysticism and Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic uh, Sufi traditions. He pays a lot of attention to Persian uh, mystical traditions. He loves and honors people like Rumi, people like Hafez, Saadi, Sanai, Attar, uh, frequently quoting from them. Uh, and uh, his writings at this stage are mystical writings discussing this spiritual journey. Books like Seven Valleys, for instance, Seven Valleys of Baha'u'llah is based upon the seven valleys that Attar in his Conference of Birds has discussed. And Baha'u'llah now elaborates on that and discusses simultaneously the question of theodicy and the question of spiritual journey in, um, in this uh, work. Four Valleys, um, Hidden Worlds, one of the most important works of, of Baha'u'llah, uh, Ode uh, of the Dove, and, uh, and, uh, and a number of other works. These are uh, constituting the first stage of, of his life. So the basic point, the basic principle emphasized in all these first stage of writings is a spiritual interpretation of reality. Namely, for Baha'u'llah, our reality is ultimately a spiritual. Our reality are reflections of God. And in this first stage of writings, although he has uh, a different take on so many categories and he reinterprets categories and so on, but primarily, he's affirming the arc of ascent as it has been traditionally discussed. In the handout that I gave you, I have some examples at the end of some of the statements of Baha'u'llah for different stages. You won't have the time that I would read them and discuss them, but I thought that later on you can yourself. So, now we come to the second stage of the writings of Baha'u'llah, and then the third stage of writings of Baha'u'llah. What I'm going to argue is that the second stage writings of Baha'u'llah and the third stage writings of Baha'u'llah are two different stages of his arc of descent. So beyond the arc of ascent, which is the focus of the first stage of his writings, the second stage writings of Baha'u'llah and the third stage writings of Baha'u'llah are two different uh, moments within the arc of descent, the way that I discussed it before. So what is the second stage writings of Baha'u'llah? The second stage of the writings of Baha'u'llah begins in the year 1861. Um, January 1861, he writes uh, this very uh, central book in the Baha'i faith, the Book of Certitude, Kitab-e-Iqan. Uh, 
which is the, the most important expression of this second stage. Uh, and this continues. Uh, he's going to be exiled in 1863 from Baghdad to first Istanbul and then to Adrianople. Uh, and finally from Adrianople to Palestine to Akko. Uh, that is in 1868. So up to 1867, this second stage continues from 1861 to 1867 is the second stage. The dominant, well, the language that he uses in the second stage is the language that the clerics are familiar with and they use it. Discussion of the nature of religion, discussion of the meaning of different statements in different <coughs> scriptures, and the concept of uh, promised one that different religions uh, are waiting for, and the religious categories discussed in the, like for instance, what is the day of resurrection? What is the concept of uh, a sacred person should return to the world? For instance, she's believed that <coughs> when the promised one, the, the Qa'im, the 12 Imam would appear, Prophet Muhammad and other Imams also would return to this world. So what is this, the meaning of this concept of return? What is the meaning of the concept that for example, in Islam, on the basis of the Quranic concept of the seal of prophets, Prophet Muhammad is defined as the seal of prophets. The idea is that Prophet Muhammad becomes the last prophet of God, and Islam becomes the last religion. These sort of discussion issues that clerics, in their understanding of religion and religious culture and history, they are preoccupied with. These become the topics that Baha'u'llah writes in this second stage. The Dominant principle in the second stage of the writings of Baha'u'llah is what in the language of philosophy, social theory, we call it historical consciousness. In the language of the uh, Baha'i idioms, usually it is called principle of progressive revelation. But in, uh, in reality, it is, it is a much more complex concept, and it is really the concept of historical consciousness. What is historical consciousness? It's a concept that in 19th century, Western philosophy and social theory increasingly became important. From Hegel's dialectical philosophy to all the major figures of sociology, Marx, uh, Weber, and, and others, um, what we have uh, th this basic idea that Humanity, society, human being is a dynamic entity, that it has history, it doesn't have nature, it's not fixed. And therefore in this conception, this historical consciousness, the idea is that what is good in a particular moment of history is not necessarily good in another moment of human history. And therefore every aspect of life is changing, is dialectical, is dynamic, and the like. This is the principle that Baha'u'llah emphasizes in, in the second stage of his writings. And uh, it is uh, interesting to note that uh, Baha'u'llah really represents the most radical advocate of historical consciousness, uh, even in relation to Western philosophy and sociology, because there, there was no connection between the two. These are independent. Uh, uh, movements going on, uh, but uh, if you look at historical consciousness in 19th century uh, Western philosophy or social, so sociology, there are two limitations. One is that usually people who believe that society is constantly changing, transforming, moving is historical, they apply, it, they apply this only to the past. And for the present, Almost all of them believe that history has already reached, or very soon is going to reach its final destination. In Hegel, dialectic is like that. All, everything is dialectical, but right now in Prussian state, in Hegel's own philosophy, reason, or spirit, which is God in, in a sense, has achieved its full, ultimate, total self-consciousness. In Marx, for example, the same di dialectic ends up now in communist mode of production, which is soon going to be, it's imminent to be realized, 
And that becomes the end of all alienations, all injustice. In a sense, the kingdom of God would be established on earth. And the idea is that dialectic has finished. There would be no qualitative transformation from now. For Baha'u'llah, he emphasizes historical consciousness, but there is no end to this uh, transformation. And so, uh, uh, so uh, uh, ideas that Baha'u'llah present also, he presents them as principles or ideas which are relevant to this particular unique stage of development of humanity, but this is just one moment in this constant transformation of society and history. The second uh, difference is that uh, in uh, 19th century philosophy or social theory, um, dialectic, this historical consciousness usually is applied to the realm of material culture. And with regard to the realm of God, either God or spirit, the, the whole concept of is denied, negated, like in Marxist theory, for example, or that with regard to that, dialectic is not applied. One good example is Hegel himself, perhaps the greatest figure of historical consciousness, who believes that with regard to the religious truth, Jesus was the last word. And therefore, Christianity, he understands as the last religion of the world. And he believes that the concept of Trinity in Christianity is actually the same concept of dialectic that he believes is the final ful fulfillment of philosophical truth. And therefore, he says that after, after Christianity, there is no further uh, religious uh, truth. There would be religious, there, there would be new truth in philosophical or artistic forms and so forth, not in, in the form of religious consciousness. What uh, defines historical consciousness in Baha'u'llah is precisely the opposite. Um, namely, for Baha'u'llah, not only material culture is historical, more importantly, the realm of the word of God is historical, is dynamic, is constantly changing. The principle that uh, Baha'u'llah emphasizes is that the whole spiritual understanding of the world, which was the principle of his first stage writings, mm -hmm. actually implies this historical consciousness. Because the realm of the spirit is the realm of self-transformation. It is the spirit which is active. And this has, of course, the biblical, as well as Quranic uh, basis that you have a living God as opposed to idols who are dead and they don't do anything and they are as they have been. The living God is the one who acts, transforms uh, the, the world, uh, interferes in, in history, is active. And the, uh, of course, for, for, from the point of view of Baha'u'llah, the essence of God is not changing, it's not historical. But religion is not the realm of the essence of God. Religion is the realm of revelation of God in this world, reflection of God in this world. And for that reason, concept of a spirit, concept of word of God, is essentially, fundamentally, much more than nature, is dynamic. So if Darwin, for instance, in 1852, publishes uh, his uh, work emphasizing evolution at the level of nature, more or less, uh, similar time, Baha'u'llah writes to emphasize that the real concept of evolution, historicity, applies to, re to the realm of the word of God, applies to the spiritual dimension, and in a secondary way to the uh, material realm. Why I call this the first stage of the arc of descent. Remember, I mentioned that the first stage of the writings of Baha'u'llah can be understood as the arc of ascent. And then the rest of the writings of Baha'u'llah becomes identified as an arc of descent, which has to be the completion and re really uh, realization of that previous arc of ascent. The reason is that immediately from this consciousness of the unity of all reality, consciousness of God, <coughs> the first ascent is discovery of the realm of history 
And of course, the realm of prophets of God, the realm of messengers of God, the realm of religious culture and spiritual truths. And the point of Baha'u'llah in all the second stage of writings is the principle of the unity in diversity of religions, unity in diversity of prophets. And his point is that the truths of all prophets of God are one and the same. What differentiates, for instance, Prophet Muhammad from uh, Moses, from Jesus, from Zoroaster, from Buddha, from Zoroaster, Zoroaster I mentioned, from the Bab, from Baha'u'llah, according to Baha'u'llah, is, is only their physical and their human characteristics. The body of these people are not important. The body is a secondary created thing. Mm -hmm. And their body does not define their truth. Their truth is defined in terms of revelation of God, that, that is spiritual truth, that Holy Ghost. But however this truth is defined, that truth is one and the same in all of them. But this one truth reflects itself, manifests itself in the world in accordance with the dialogue with humanity, with society. So the changing dynamic character of the world, of society, of humanity, means that the form of expression, the form of manifestation of that same truth changes also in time, corresponding to the changes in history. That means that all prophets of God are one, and the same, although they are diverse in terms of different historical expressions. The importance of this new concept is that the con you, you can see that the consciousness of unity now is applied to the realm of religion. And so reconciliation of all religions, coming together of all religions, consciousness of the unity of all religions, love equally for all prophets of God, this becomes the message of Baha'u'llah. This is the first stage of that arc of Arc of descent. Corresponding to this, of course, is the conception of religion. How we de define religion and identity of religion? The clerical understanding of the identity of religion, truth of religion, is something. Baha'u'llah's understanding of the truth or identity of religion is something else, and they are completely opposed. Usually, not always, but usually the clerical understanding of the truth of religion is that it defines religion in terms of its legalistic character, in terms of particular rituals, particular laws. That is usually defined as the truth and identity of religion. Once you define religion in this form, immediately my religion becomes opposed to other religions. Immediately the relation of different religions becomes a, a, a relation of superiority or inferiority, relation of, relations of conflict, hostility, and the like. For Baha'u'llah, it is the exact opposite. The truth of religion, identity of religion, is defined in the common spiritual truth of all religions. So the laws or rituals of different religions, these are token expressions, secondary expressions, which are historically specific, culturally specific, expression of that same common truth, that same common spiritual truth manifests itself at different times in different moments of history in different cultures in terms of particular laws or rituals, languages, and so on. And these are, of course, all sacred, but they are contingent to those particular situations. They don't define the truth of religion. So what is the characteristics of these laws, rituals? They are like the bodies of different prophets of God. If we take the bodies of prophet of God as the truth of the prophets of God, then when the body changes, we can never realize a different prophet and respect that other prophet. So um, the opposite is to understand the truth of the prophets, not in terms of their human characteristics or material physical characteristics, but in terms of their, their uh, spirit of God, that revelation of God, which is in their heart. And once we understand that, then the realm of religion, instead of being the realm of conflict and hatred, becomes the realm of unity and diversity. So Baha'u'llah's emphasis is that all religions should be united with each other, 
should love each other, should understand that all of them are one and the same. The differences that they have, these are secondary differences. They do not address the truth of any of these religions. And that people should, play, should, should pay attention to the truth of religion rather than being obsessed with these secondary symbolic expressions of religious truth. It's like forgetting the sun and becoming obsessed with the horizons out of which the sun emerges. And then denying the sun because the horizon has changed. For Baha'u'llah, you have to look at the sun regardless of the horizon. Horizons are secondary things. You have to pay attention to the sun, and it is the same sun. The third uh, stage of the writings of the Baha'u'llah, uh, sorry, of the writings of Baha'u'llah, and uh, I try to be a little bit faster discussing that, uh, is the most important stage of the writings of Baha'u'llah. When Baha'u'llah is exiled from Adrianople to Akka, to Palestine, and this was with the conspiracy of both the king of Iran and, of course, the Ottoman emperor, Ottoman sultan, and the idea was that he would be killed in, uh, he would die in, because of the difficulties of the, of, of the prison uh, in the fort. Um, and uh, it would be the end of, of this particular movement. So this exile takes place in 1868. And this becomes the beginning of the third stage of the writings of Baha'u'llah. What Baha'u'llah does in the third stage of his writings, he begins this third stage of writings by writing letters addressing rulers of the world, spiritual, as well as political. For instance, he writes a letter to the Pope, he writes a letter to King of Iran, he writes a letter to the Ottoman Sultan, he writes a letter to Queen Victoria, to Napoleon III, Alexander Tsar of Russia, and a number of others. And in these letters, he invites them to peace. The concept of peace is the central concept which is emphasized in all these writings. And this becomes the beginning of all his writings which are now addressed to the humanity. And his writings in this third stage take the form of social, political idea, discussion of a new form of civilization that should be created. And, and this becomes the most important stage of the writings of, of Baha'u'llah. And this is the second and the last and the highest stage of the Ark of Descent, namely mystical consciousness, mystical journey, now finds its highest realization at this stage. And the idea here is that we should see the whole world, all humanity, even all nature as sacred, as beautiful, as reflections of God. Everything is a mirror of God. So that conscious of unity is no longer abstract, it becomes concrete. And therefore, everything and everyone has rights. Even nature has rights in the Baha'i faith. It's not that it's not Kantian ethics that only humans have moral right. Nature is just a means to be used by humans. Nature also has right. It is a reflection of God. But with regard to human beings in particular, the two principles which are emphasized constantly is the principle of, principle of oneness of humanity and the principle of peace. And the two are, of course, are in, inseparable from each other. In discussing peace, for example, he is not uh, content with just saying that peace is good and let's have, let's have peace. Uh, his writings are far more, more than that. He addresses a specific, very concrete measures which should be taken in order uh, to, to make peace a possibility in the world. Um, for example, in these addresses that he has to uh, leaders of the world, not only he emphasizes a, a new culture of peace, which means that a new forms of understanding of the world, understanding of religion, understanding of humanity, understanding of God is, 
necessary. But he also calls for social and economic justice. And he argues that real peace is not possible as long as poverty is a persistent aspect of the world and there's so much inequality. <coughs> Kings have so much, they are rearing their, uh, their palaces, whereas people are starving uh, uh, from hunger. He emphasizes social economic justice. He emphasizes democracy, political democracy. And he argues that democratization of the world is something which is good for a strengthening state, for making people happier and more prosperous, and is, uh, is a principle that Baha'u'llah finds it uh, compatible with peace. In addition to that, he talks about changing of the structure of international relations, so that he talks about the necessity of collective security. And therefore, the idea of uh, necessity of creation of global, democratic, consultative institutions, which would make sure that nations of the world would not engage in arms race, that nations of the world have only weapons necessary for their uh, internal order, and that all these monies which are wasted for arms race would be used for reconstruction of the world. These are just examples of things that, that he's discussing. One of my areas is peace studies. And the, <coughs> the factors that I mentioned, that Baha'u'llah in 1868, a Persian uh, prisoner is addressing, is the heart of the most sophisticated present theories of peace. But uh, we don't have time to, to discuss that detail. So I'll, uh, I'll finish my discussion with giving just a few examples. Negative, namely things that he abrogates and negates, and positive, a few of them, that you can see how he is uh, calling for this uh, application of the mystical consciousness to the concrete reality of concrete realities of people we have to love and see them as reflections of God. Um, and this, uh, the, this becomes really the realization, completion, continuity of the spiritual mystical traditions of all religions of Persian mystical traditions and so on. It is not negation of them, it's not opposition of them, it's fulfillment of them, affirming their harmony and their unity. Some of the negative things uh, in his writings, immediately in all his writings from the first days, uh, he, he uh, abrogates them, rejects them. Some of them is, for instance, the idea that people who have a different religion or different ethnicity or different caste or whatever, they are impure. Uh, so nobody is, as Persians say, najis, or as in Arabic, najas. Uh, uh, everybody is pure. Baha'u'llah says that in 1863, when he is declaring, and one of those statements is here, God has revealed uh, himself, itself, herself, because God is neither he or she or thing like that, has revealed himself with all his attributes upon all beings. So all beings which, whose truth used to be oh, uh, eternally reflection of God, right now in a practical new fashion, actually becomes reflection of God. And for that reason, Baha'u'llah says everything now is immersed in the sea of purity. Nothing is impure anymore. From this, he concludes the necessity of communication with all religions, with all ethnicities, with all groups of the world. Nothing is perhaps more important and more frequently emphasized than the necessity of this communication, interaction, fellowship, association. Usually, the word is mu'ashirat. But in different contexts, it is presented in, in different forms and so on. And I have one of those statements here. He says, consort with the followers of all religions in a spirit of friendliness and fellowship. They that are endued with sincerity and faithfulness 
should associate with all the peoples and kindreds of the world <coughs> with joy and radiance, in as much as now he gives the reason why we should communicate, all people should communicate with each other, in as much as consorting with people has promoted and will continue to promote unity and concord. And then he continues. From the point of view of Baha'u'llah, the source of morality, the source of social order, what binds people together is not abstract statements of ethics, but rather it is the actual experience of interaction of people, of groups with each other. It's not the postmodern of the present time that all groups, they go and immerse themselves in, the, in their own little ethnic or religious group, and they, they think that they can never, no, nobody can understand a person from another culture, another ethnicity, another language, another religion, and so on. For Baha'u'llah, the way to create sympathy, respect for others, the way to create love, not just idea of equality, is to interact. All religions, all ethnicities, all people of the world have to interact with each other through this interaction, morality, transforming the boundaries of the self into the boundary of more universalistic identities and so on becomes <coughs> uh, possible. He eliminates, he ca categorically rejects slavery, he categorically uh, rejects the idea of apostasy, Namely, if you are born in a particular religious group, <coughs> then you want to change your religion, you have to be killed. Discrimination against any person on the basis of their beliefs, faiths, and, and so on, he categorically prohibits. The whole concept of the holy war, namely the idea that in some situations you have to use the sword, you have to use violence, discrimination, in order to promote a particular religion, the will of God, Categorically, <coughs> in a state, there are all these positive discussions, positive laws that he discusses. A few of them I just mentioned when I talked about this concept of peace and, and so on. But I finish it with this one statement of Baha'u'llah. In 1869, following the letters that he wrote to the rulers of the world, Baha'u'llah said, Ezzat az luta efe akhz shud, az maluk va ulama. Power is seized from two ranks of the people, from the kings and the ecclesiastics. This is the way it is translated. What Baha'u'llah is saying is that from now on, in terms of the logic of history uh, and the reality of present and future, um, we can have neither uh, monarchy, nor we can have uh, the rule of the clerics. It's very important, this too, because it shows Baha'u'llah's understanding of the concept of democracy. Baha'u'llah believes that political democracy is impossible, real political democracy is impossible, namely rejection of monarchy and participation of people in decision making, without a spiritual democracy. As long as people define themselves as incapable of thinking independently, and they are subservient to and follow and imitate blindly their clerics, their religious leaders, this culture, this society cannot create a society of equal rights, a society of uh, political democracy. And for that reason, whenever he's discussing political democracy, power is taken, is seized from the kings, he immediately asks me that also from the clerics. And all discussion, the issue which is constant in the, all the three stages of his writings is emphasis on the fact that God, we are Images of God. Because we are images of God, God has created us capable of independent thinking. And for that reason, for him, imitating others, renouncing our humanity, renouncing our reason, assuming that the cleric can understand the will of God, and we have to become uh, uh, following that person in terms of anything important and so on, 
uh, for Baha'u'llah, this means the greatest rejection of God. Because God created us with reason. And God wants us to use our reason and so on. And so this realization of reason, which is the realization of our spiritual truth, from Baha'u'llah's point of view, requires both uh, political democracy, namely people should participate. He, dis he doesn't discuss the forms of that. Forms of that can be different. But people should participate in decision making in politics. But also, this should be accompanied with a culture of empowerment in which people see themselves as equal, as capable of thinking for themselves, as seeing it's m their moral duty to think and responsibly make decisions and so on. So this was a, a very brief expression of the stages of the writings of Baha'u'llah. There are so many writings. What are the three principles, spiritual interpretation of reality, historical consciousness, and global consciousness? Uh, and how this brings a new concept of spiritual mysticism, that the arc of ascent now becomes accompanied with particular forms of the new arc of descent. Thanks for listening. Thank First of all, thank you very much for this uh, extensive explanation of Hadrat Baullah's writings. I feel we need a life, maybe, to understand the depths and the scope of his uh, all what he wrote. I, I have a double of question, or a question with two sides. The first one would be, uh, if you could please, in a simple way, uh, tell us what would be the changes or the impact of the writing of Baha'u'llah in the long 19th century. I mean from the time he wrote it till maybe the First World War? And maybe what do you feel today in the 21st century was accomplished or is done from this time to today, from 150 years to today? Thank you. Um, the question is, uh, is, not, is, a, is a great question, but uh, answering that question re requires uh, months of, of discussions and so on. Courses I teach uh, uh, in different ways uh, discuss the same question that we have with regard to Iran. In the case of the Iran, what happened, the impact of the Bab, the impact of Baha'u'llah, their ideas, and so on. So for example, in the case of the Middle East and Iran, you see that Baha'u'llah is the first Iranian who talks of, of uh, political democracy or of necessity of separation of church and state. Uh, he's really the first person, both in practice and in discussions, he questions and rejects uh, slavery. These are um, uh, elements which were completely new in terms of the consciousness of the society. But in addition to uh, these things, uh, his writings, of course, uh, deals with issues which uh, was completely outside of uh, uh, concerns and preoccupations of the time. For example, his uh, emphasis on uh, changing international, global structures and talking about peace, the necessity of peace, writing letters to rulers of the world, mm -hmm. uh, addressing uh, the necessity of peace, and so on. So from the point of view of Baha'u'llah, religion is not something arbitrary. It's not something arbitrary will of God which is imposed on the world. Religion becomes reflection of God in this world. And therefore, it becomes a dialogue between God and humanity. And therefore, particular form or expressions that religion would take would correspond to a particular stage of development of humanity. One of the most important elements which defines that third stage writings of Baha'u'llah, and I have one of them, one of those uh, quotations uh, in the handout, is that Baha'u'llah says that humanity has arrived at a particular stage in which the whole humanity has become one organic body. Uh, my work is really, or used to be, I don't know, in social theory. Um, 
19th century sociology and philosophy and so on, the most important thing that he discovered was the concept of society and culture. The idea was that societies are not you know, a mechanical thing. Some of individuals randomly come together. Rather, it has a unity. It, it is an organic entity. Sometimes it's called organic theory of a state. And so societies become living entities which have a unity. They have interdependence, different parts of society. And there is a culture of overall unity and so on. For instance, romantic movement was based upon this idea that these cultures, these nations, they are completely different because they are organic, and therefore they can never communicate with each other. Something that now, in different forms, in postmodernism and cultural relativism has, has returned to us. But what was important was that Baha'u'llah, in the middle of 19th century, declared, regard ye the world as one human body. For Baha'u'llah, this is the new stage of transformation of history. You remember his second stage of writings emphasized historical consciousness, that things are historical and change. The third stage of his writings is the logical realization of the second stage. Maybe because humanity is dynamic and changes, right now you have to look at the new stage of this historical development. And for Baha'u'llah, this new stage of historical development is the very fact that humanity, not a nation, not a society, not Japanese, not the French, but humanity has become organically one. And therefore, from the point of view of Baha'u'llah, the only way that problems of the world from now on can be solved is that the consciousness of humanity also catch up with this objective reality. So in, in terms of our uh, cultural understandings, religious understandings, political, economic, and so on, we have to come up with the concept of the unity of humankind and transform our habits of thought, transform our institutions in order to realize this. And this becomes ultimately expressions of that mystical moment that we see everything as one, as reflections of God. The meaning of this is that from the point of view of Baha'u'llah, the world is going to experience a lot of uh, problems, and it would be unable to solve it if it continues to remain fixated in more or less tribal uh, prior forms of consciousness in terms of its understanding of religion, in terms of its understanding of extreme forms of nationalism, its in, in terms of its understanding of racism, in terms of its uh, understanding of colonialism, imperialism, and the like, and sexism, uh, equality of men and women is one of the most important principles that Baha'u'llah emphasized all the time, categorically, in his new understanding of, of the world. So from the point of view of Baha'u'llah, history is in a unique situation that contradictory processes are working together. And for him, this is, this is manifest in every different part of the world, whether it is Iran or whether it is Europe, every part of the world. On the one hand, the world and institutions, from its technology to other aspects of the world, are moving us towards this unity, as you can see in different forms of consciousness of globalization. On the contrary, because of our previous uh, um, uh, ideas which was based upon prejudice. The word that he uses is ta'assop, which cannot be translated in English really adequately, because prejudice is effect of ta'assop. Ta'assop is from ospa, means group. Ta'assop means reduction of the identity to one particularist group, which means then seeing others as enemies or strangers, which then, of course, this brings and creates prejudice. So you would have differential judgments and so on. From the point of view of Baha'u'llah, the world, instead of recognizing that should reject varieties of prejudices, defines its identity as a human being, and then in terms of diverse cultures, religions, language, and finds those diversity beautiful, but in the context of that unity, the world is moving increasingly towards a more tribalistic consciousness. And this is what you see right now in, the, in every part of the world. On the one hand, we are becoming more 
uh, interdependent globally with each other. On the other hand, our philosophies, our social theories, our political philosophies are making us more and more defined in a tribal fashion, which we cannot communicate with others. Identity is reduced to particular traditions and, and so on. This becomes, as I mentioned, I can't really answer your question unless I have days and so on. Um, and so I better stop, otherwise I just can't. We have, we have five minutes, and I want to leave room for any other questions. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and then back. No, go ahead. I may be wrong, but I thought that the best system that the law recommends for the world is kingship. Uh, no, that is not true. Uh, Baha'u'llah, in varieties of uh, his uh, writings, including the letter that he wrote to the Queen Victoria, he praises Queen Victoria for two reasons. And he says one is that you have uh, prohibited uh, uh, slave traffic, and he says that this is in agreement with the will of God, and uh, he rejects uh, slavery, and so he praises this particular action. And the other one uh, is that he says that you have extended the reign of democracy consultation to the public. Two years before that, Queen Victoria did that. And so suffrage became a little bit more extended uh, uh, in, uh, in England. So in varieties of ways, uh, Baha'u'llah says that if we have kingship, kingship in the sense that monarchy is just a symbolic ceremonial phenomenon, reflection and expression symbolically of the unity of society, but the real decision-making, political decision-making, is, is in a parliamentary democratic fashion, then he says that that is acceptable. As I mentioned, the particular form of democratization, according to Baha'u'llah, is open. Different cultures, societies, they have to decide for themselves. But the principle that social, polit political, collective decision-making should be based upon participation and equality of people. That is, that's why he says, "Ezat as luta efe achshur as moluk va ulama." So, in the future of the world, from the Baha'i point of view, from Baha'u'llah's point of view, there is no place either for priests in different forms or for kings and monarchs, unless the concept of monarchy becomes a ceremonial, like what increasingly became in England then. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you have found stylistic differences among the three phases, uh, whether it be the lyrical quality of the writing or uh, the choice of words or uh, the length of sections of writing or sentence length or things like that. Um, the first stage uh, is uh, um, is uh, distinct as compared to the other two stages in the sense that because the addresses are usually the mystics and so the language of this, most of them are written in response to the questions that one of the mystics, either in one of, one of them was in Kazemain, Bahara was for two years, for instance, in the mountains of Soleimaniye. So, uh, and particularly Naqshbandi mystics. Uh, uh, and they, they had extremely close relation with Baha'u'llah, and they, they perceived Baha'u'llah as, as one of the uh, you know, favored ones of God. Uh, so a number of these writings of Baha'u'llah actually is written addressing these uh, Muslim mystics. And so the language uh, uses a lot of categories and concepts um, which is uh, familiar with Islamic mysticism, Sufism, and heavy expression of Persian poetry. He has also his own Masnavi that he has written, which is similar in a style to Rumi's Masnavi. It is short, it's about 20, 30 pages. Uh, but it belongs again to the same uh, stage and same style. Uh, so, um, but the language of Baha'u'llah is, uh, is more or less the same. In, um, um, so if, if you, you are familiar with the language of Baha'u'llah, you can easily detect 
in through all these uh, stages. But the categories which are being discussed and so on vary. Although I should say that a number of ideas which are discussed in the second stage or the third stage can be found in the writings of the first stage. Uh, but the dominant principle, the focus, are completely uh, distinct. But uh, again, your question uh, is a very good question in, in the sense that some particular formulations of this question might be a good question for further research. Um, I haven't noted uh, distinct differences, but, but in terms of categories and so on, the first essay is completely distinct from us. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. I went across.